Gary Keenan is a professor of gerontology at St. Thomas University. His book, Pathway to Stillness, is his latest publication. He's co-authored and co-edited several other books. Our conversation wandered into many areas, but the root of it all is more or less the same. Stillness, breathing, and a pathway to happiness. So thanks so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so you've written several books, co-authored several books, co-edited several books. What's that process like? Is it like herding cats? And, and you've got all these ideas and you're trying to get it down to 250, 300 pages? The um, well, the academic books are more of a, I wouldn't say a formula, but there's more of a format for writing academic books. Uh, whether it's if it's an edited volume, then you collect together a group of people who have interesting things to contribute, and then it's a lot of editing, copy editing, and organizing cats that way. Um, but this book, Pathways to Stillness, is my own, more my own material. It's not an academic book, and that in that process, I've, I have learned and am learning to be a writer, rather than an academic. And there is a difference. It, 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 it's, it is, you know, it's a different way of speaking. Um, uh, you're hoping to speak, uh, as I've ha had good feedback with it. People saying it's like you're speaking, not at me or to me, but with me. And, I, and that was what I was hoping to do with the book, but it was very different uh, uh, challenge for me. Yeah. Well, that almost surfaces. Uh, you almost had to start to practice what you preach, because you help people with their narrative, don't you? As part of your other books was um, the storytelling and a life storytelling, and here you had to do it. Yeah, that's true. I, I had to take uh, material from my own story um, and make it a story as opposed to an account of, of events and that sort of thing. Yeah, to make it a story yeah. uh, and and go through, yes, go through that per, process firsthand of picking and choosing things and, I guess, guiding myself through it too. You know? Yeah. What, what was the most fun about all that? Um, well, it's a creative, it's more a creative process. I mean, I don't want to... I'm sure that um, academics would find their research to be creative too, in, in terms of you know designing yeah. studies and findings and that sort of thing. But um, but for me, the um, uh, as I've you know read a lot of of course over the years, read a lot of uh, writers' work, and you know they talk about like Oscar Wilde used to say, I I had a successful day. I put a comma in this morning and I took it out this evening. <laughs> <laughs> and it really does get, it really does get down to that where you're hoping to make a, a point with this. Uh, in, in this in this book, there are short chapters, so they're trying to make the point in a small amount of space and and time, and to, and to get it to get it across in a in a creative way. You know? yeah. Did you did you feel it hard to decide what goes in the book and what gets left out? Because I'm imagining. There's probably 80 or 90 percent that doesn't make it into the book for the sake of the narrative arc that does carry the story in the book. Was yes, it? with this, uh, this book has a sort of long history and short history. The longer history is uh, some of the material goes back at least 30 years. Um, and you're only 39, so <laughs> you, went, you went back pretty far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the material some of the material goes back a long way that I've been teaching and studying either at university or in my Tai Chi practice. Um, and then when I, I, I finally decided to write the book, it maybe took two or three years to, to start, as, you, as you're saying, to collect the material that would go in and not have material that didn't need to go in. So that, that's a difficult yeah. or challenging process as well. Um, because I, I have um, material from several different themes, major themes. Yeah. Good. You can relax. You can you, you let her go. Yeah. You're not with Ross Ingram anymore doing, <laughs> doing this show. The, um, so somewhere in there, because we're talking about the process of crafting the book, but um, dive into your content. Like what, what made you want to write it? And what do you think is the key things in the book that you want people to kind of catch or that for you felt 
well, kind of exposed or naked, or, but that's where a truth will emerge when we get down into that space. Yeah, I think um, originally <clears throat> I always wanted to write a book like this, um, and I, I hummed and hawed about it. I I thought, well, some of these themes of spirituality and so on have uh, the people have been writing about them for thousands of years. You know, what do I have to say for that? You know. <laughs> And it was actually my friend and colleague uh, Bill Randall, who uh, he he we were uh, having a glass of wine one evening, and he said, uh, "You know, you have to write that book." He said, "You you talk about this, and you talk about these ideas, and you have to write that book." And I said, "Okay, that that was kind of a, a key yeah. Uh, point yeah. of of having that suggestion made to me." So. And and I, as I said, I always wanted to write the write a book like this that were was basically my two cents about these uh, these uh, issues. And um, having read many others, I thought, well, some of them speak to me, some of them don't speak to me. So perhaps my ideas will speak to some people who wouldn't otherwise be uh, uh, invited to look at their own spiritual life or their life story yeah. in general. And uh, so that's where it started. And then I had already collected material over the years, uh, some of which went into my academic work. And uh, and then I just took it from there. I started looking that material over and I thought, yeah, and then I got really excited about, about focusing on what I had to say. So you got over that feeling of insignificance of uh, the volume of work that's been done on spirituality and soul work and found your own voice in it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, your story about feeling like who am I to write about this? So many before I've done it reminds me of a story from my graduate days, having to write a paper on Karl Marx's socialized humanity, and I'm like, well, who am I? Like I'm 26. Like, pfft, well, <laughs> what do I have to add to this? So I actually opened the essay, which I think I still have somewhere. It's one of those ones I saved. That uh, I stole a line from uh, who was it? The, the line is. Um, I was as significant as a speck of fly dirt dried upon a windshield, <laughs> which is the opening line to a song. And it all bugs me now. I won't remember mm. who it was. I think it was Genesis. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So you've had your own version of the speck of fly dirt on the windshield. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and you know, when you think we're all, if you believe, we're all connected in these ideas. We, we, we kind of make up a, a big picture all together with our little specks. <laughs> and they're all the specs are important too so uh, yeah very yeah, much yeah very much then i felt much more free to to uh just go for it you know? yeah. so so the book is sort of a chronicle of your personal journey weaving together several themes yeah yeah it's uh um i i talk it's about stillness that's one of the themes that it's about that's why it's called pathways to stillness um so the book talks about what stillness is it, it, it it's meant for different audiences really it's a broad spectrum of audiences it, it i'm hoping it's helpful or has already had some feedback about that that it's been helpful to people who are curious mm -hmm. they sort of walk around the spiritual stuff and they uh ah, well i'm not really interested in that i'm not a religious person and mm -hmm. but i have a lot of stress in my life and i i, I i'm looking for <laughs> How could I get some help with that? So the book talks about partly about stillness and that it is something that's just naturally in us, but we don't pay much attention to it in our busyness of our lives, particularly in our culture. So it is about stillness and how to find it and where it hides itself kind of thing. Um, and then, um, but importantly, how I have come across uh, paying more attention to stillness. So the book talks about um, uh, uh, an intense experience I had over 20 years ago now. And as we human beings do, this uh, I had a psychiatrist colleague once, he once said, uh, everybody has an Achilles heel. Yeah. And uh, one person, it'll be something that doesn't bother another person whatsoever, but it bothers them. In my case, it was uh, what you'd call a nasty divorce over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the process that, what's more, what, what became 
rather or over a period of time, what became really important about that was not so much the divorce anymore. It was what what was uh, what was my story? What, what was I experiencing through that process? So in other words, it could have been for someone else, it might be an illness or grieving over something. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was the event that occurred. But it was the it was my response to that that became more of of interest to me. Um, and so I go through some um, phases of that in in the book. Uh, you know, first uh, there really was no story. It was just uh, feeling awful uh, and fearful and anxious and having no idea what I was going to do with my life. I didn't know if I wanted to keep working. I didn't know where I wanted to live. I, I just uh, was, you know, just uh, thrown totally off track. Um, but then as time went on, I started to see new things out of that store, out of that experience, um, like caring more for stillness because I managed, I started to see that my training in martial arts and Tai Chi before started to become more present to me that I could take refuge in that sort of thing uh, and then just gradually things got better and better and I saw a new life and and a new uh, partner and a new family hmm. yeah. fascinating thanks for sharing that yeah. <clears throat> that's that's big you you made it easy but it's a lot bigger than what you just framed up because those precipitating events or those moments that come and smack us in our lives and how we cope with them, th those are big moments in a life. And to have the courage to then weave that into the storytelling. Is, uh, I, I want to go down a male route because often um, the typical storyline is that men don't talk about their feelings. And, and that frustrates me a bit because I see it the other way, that men talk about their feelings <laughs> all the time. It's just not done in the same way. So as you went through your journey, um, and an emotional journey, and spiritual journey, did you find that your maleness was part of the challenge or part of the where the breakthrough was going to occur? That's a really good question, a good way to, to put it, because um, prior to this experience, I, um, <clears throat> I've been in mar into the, interested in martial arts for a long time. I was doing a lot of karate training at that time. And the way we learned that, I figured, um, you know, I've been blessed with a healthy body and a healthy mind. And really, I I didn't think there was anything that could come up that would uh, that I couldn't deal with. You know. <laughs> oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I just you know I kick kick and punch my way through it or figure some way I no problem. You know. Yeah. Um. So th so that part of this experience uh, knocked me right out. Like it, it, there there no, I wasn't going to fix this myself. I wasn't going to. This wasn't going to get better right away. There I didn't so. So I had to learn, and you do learn this in the martial arts, but this is where it became a transition point that that um, I had to give up control. Mm -hmm. I could not control this situation. I, I was in a lot of pain, and I could not uh, solve it myself. So I had to start seeking some, some help. And uh, I tell the story in, in the book early on in the process where my uh, karate teacher phoned me from Toronto. And we hadn't seen each other for several years, so I don't even know how he knew what had happened. <laughs> but he called me up and he said, uh, Gary, he said, I've been through this. Just survive. One hour at a time, one day at a time, and so on. Just don't, nothing else, just survive. And somehow, you know, that those words sunk in at, at that point earlier on, and I started to take that, that advice. So the transition was from thinking I had all this control and could, you know, uh, as a male, as you say, especially stere stereotypical male, yeah. could fix this to, uh, no, no, this is, this isn't going to happen this way. I've got to, I've got to let go. I've got to see a different way of uh, being a male in the world. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The um, parallels, my own journey elements, and then raising my boys, because I was a stay-at-home dad with twin boys that are now 26. So watching them embody some of the teachings and lessons that I did as I'm raising them, that strength is in softness as opposed to in rigidity or control. So they were often out of step with their male buddies, <laughs> with their peer group, because they were approaching things from a different way. 
rather than the way their buddies were. So, you know, impose your will on the world and provide, you know, all of that compared to stillness or be present just and let allow what happens to happen, yeah. but be present in it. Now, those sort of shifts in perception create a shift in reality. Yeah, and, and that has evolved for me now has evolved into a <clears throat> a strong interest in sharing this perspective. And it, it, my my own journey has evolved through. Uh, I moved from harder martial arts to Tai Chi uh, quite some years ago, mm-hmm. and Tai Chi is all about that. Mm-hmm. Ta- the, the Tai Chi philosophy is uh, is uh, you know Yin and Yang. It's um, Yin energy, which is more female, yielding, accommodating energy and that's the hallmark of tai chi so you have to um if you can't let go or or become soft in tai chi you can't learn it beyond a certain point and um so i find that um i love the art and i'm i'm still very much in, involved and probably always will be in the art but i'm also increasingly interested in how that how that uh, how i can share that with uh, other folks uh men in particular uh to learn this, I call it the third way of um, uh, of, be, of being able to uh, encounter life situations um, beyond the fight or flight dichotomy that we tend to only, only focus on. Right? Yeah, because psychology has kind of dominated some of that narrative the past 40 or 50 years. So it stays in their paradigm, stays in their word frame, you know. And when you take a soul journey instead, like Robert Bly or John Lee or Sam Keen, and you go down that road, um, it shifts. The words allow you to shift the perception and the softness easily creaks in. And as well, the willingness to go into the, the dark spaces, the shadow space, because that's where the breakthroughs will occur. Right. And, right. and find that courage to do that no matter how you get in there. So somewhere in there, you switched your energy switch from combative karate to adaptable or shifting tai chi. Right. Makes sense. Right. Is it the same energy? Well, I think uh, <laughs> it's an odd question because energy is energy, but yeah. how you're manifesting it's radically different. Yeah, I think it, <clears throat> I think that's probably the it's it's a different um, use of the uh, of the energy and um, <clears throat> the the in in martial arts it very much depends on the teacher too. Okay. So you could have a hard style of martial arts like karate, but but you might have a teacher that knows that and sort of uh, in the old, some time ago now, but when I grew up in this, there was Bruce Lee, for example, yep. and he broke all the stereotypes of those things, and he didn't care whether it was mar- hard style, soft style, he just energy, as you yeah. say. Well, he has that famous quote about be the water. Yes, yes, <laughs> and I think Muhammad Ali kind of felt like a butterfly, sting like a bee, you know, Muhammad Ali had that kind of sense of things too, I think. Yeah. But the um, But I think it's just a different... Emphasis like we like in Tai Chi, it's not uh, if you have Yin, which is the softer energy, which allows you to step back, take a step back and watch things and observe things rather than the fight or flight version. It's a softer energy, but it is an energy. And um, I gave a workshop a couple of weeks ago up at St. Thomas on uh, in a symposium called Varieties of Meditative Experience. And I gave a two-hour workshop on my stuff from the book, and one of the participants said, "You know," he said, "I read, a, I read about this stuff like let go, let go." He said, "That doesn't mean much to me," but he said, "Follow." You say fight, flight, or follow. He said, "Following, I feel like I'm still doing something. I'm not running away. I'm not trying to control it, but I'm still doing something. I'm still there." And he said, "That makes a lot more sense to me to try and work with some of my stuff." You know. Interesting where the breakthrough occurs or the aha moment registers. Yeah, exactly. And I learned something from him too because I thought, yeah, I can, I can use that as another vehicle for for elaborating on what I'm trying to share. Yeah, you know? trying to add to it. And in that paradigm of the fight or flight, isn't there also the freeze? You know, because sometimes you just you're absolutely rigid in the face of that terror that's coming at you. Yeah, you just sort of choke yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there's that there's that too and and um probably is important to include the fact that you know we're all human beings and none of this stuff <laughs> works like a pill or like a, a light switch it's a process but but um 
But you can, the, the, the wonderful thing I think is you can learn little by little to, uh, re, to respond to situations that are not pleasant or stressful uh, mm. in this other way. You can, you can get better at it uh, over time. You know? yeah. And, and we're also, you're also mapping out on, this will simplify it maybe too far, but human beings are water balloons with emotions in them, basically, because we're mainly water and, and we're driven by emotions. Mm -hmm. Those emotions are a form of energy. You're teaching people how to manage or work with their energy in a better way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I, and, and trying to do that in a um, practical way, situations too so uh, like with I've given some talks to uh, to men about this and and um, in Tai Chi there's a physical way to give them the sensation of this letting go where, where, where they try to push me and I'm not running away and I'm not trying to resist them but I'm guiding I'm watching and following and so they get a feeling they say oh my goodness you're not yeah you're not running and you're not trying to push me over you're just <laughs> following what I'm doing. So they get an, an, a sense, well, maybe there is something. And then I suggest, maybe next time you have a, an argument with your partner, instead of what you do, what do you do? I, I, t I tend to, to run, you know, to, I just want to get out of, get out of the situation for, or I yell yeah. back. Avoid conflict. Yeah. Avoid conflict. And, uh, and I've done that for a lot in my, a lot of time in my life, but I'm gradually trying to say, and I suggest to, you know, and, and that's where the real life from my own background helps because they say, okay, this guy's been through the same kind of stuff. So, you know, and I just say, why don't you just wait? Don't say anything. Just wait, observe, take a breath, take, just, and, and see what happens. You know? and, uh, and they say, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> sort of, okay, maybe that's a good idea. You can, you can certainly see the the eyes blinking and the recognition that we all <laughs> are dealing with, yeah. with these situations, you know. Yeah. It's almost a bit of Sun Tzu with uh, sometimes the best move is no move yes. in, in that sequence yeah. of things. Yeah. But uh, that might leave a bit of a vacuum, so your suggestion about breathing um, becomes important. It was striking me as we talk um, that you're talking about energy and movement with energy and flow, and the title of the book is about stillness. So... Does the paradox hold? Um, Does that make sense? Can you dive into that relationship between stillness and in movement? Yeah, yeah. And again, I I like using the uh, the Tai Chi philosophy for that. In Tai Chi, you talk about stillness in movement <clears throat> and movement in stillness. So when we, for example, we do sort of a standing meditation in Tai Chi and you relax and you get your body in, in the right frame, the, the, the Chi, which is, you know, Tai Chi would say is already there, the energy, like you're saying, the energy is already there. The more you relax, you start to feel the movement of the energy in your body. And then when you're doing the Tai Chi breathing movements or the form, you're practicing uh, stillness in movement. You're trying to get everything so it doesn't feel, you have the same feeling of stillness, of quiet whether you're moving or you're standing still. And then I guess the extrapolation of that to life is, you know, you're trying to take this practice, what I call more formal stillness practice, and bring it into life situations, hmm. like uh, loss or suffering or health things or career things, to try to bring that into your everyday life, which is not unique to Tai Chi, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, other meditative traditions would would uh, would encourage the same thing. I just happen to yeah, like this one. But. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you keep working your way there. Right. <laughs> the um, can you talk a bit about breathing? And we're we're really into some mechanics of Tai Chi, which is great because that then sets up um, how you've come to be here. Because it was your your dance for how you've you know, dealt with your traumatic moment and your precipitating event and. And that'll serve benefit for others. And they'll know kind of the content of the book, too, the spirit mm -hmm. of the book. But in there is the breathing thing. So we'll say breathing like we know what it is, but often <laughs> it's a lot more than how we speak of it lately. Yeah, and um, I mean, in, in, in Tai Chi, we uh, practice what's called reverse, reverse breathing. So sometimes uh, 
when you're breathing, you <clears throat> you fill your stomach first, and then your chest, and then move up, and then <clears throat> and then let it out and uh, soften your stomach as you uh, breathe out. In Tai Chi, you start breathing from below the, the diaphragm, from below your navel, where the center is, and uh, the center of gravity and the center of the energy is said to be yep. a couple of inches below the navel. Yep. And what you do in Tai Chi is you draw in from under there. So the first movement is in and up. And as you breathe out, you relax, you, your stomach goes out. It, you don't force it out, but you just let it go out. Yep. Um, so whatever tradition you take, that uh, I do agree with a lot of yoga teachers and uh, other people that say, if you do nothing else but you learn how to breathe, you're going to help yourself <laughs> quite a bit. Because the breathing is, I'm not, um, uh, yeah, I, I know a little bit about the physiological part of it. I'm certainly not a physiologist. Yeah. But the whole idea when you breathe from your stomach area, rather, most of us breathe from our chest, right, in, in our culture anyway. Mm -hmm. We start off uh, breathing down there, babies and yep. and so on. We 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 start off with our center of gravity down there, but then we it comes up as yeah, well, probably stress and life comes up. We yeah. start to our big brains try to take control of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so the more you get your your breath and um, in in Tai Chi, you just at first anyway, you just start to move and relax, and the more you relax, your breathing starts to drop down. And then usually it's later on that you bring that conscious breathing into the form more, uh, into the form itself. But at first you're more can you just get get yourself to relax a bit. And your breathing will start to go down, and, and it's affecting your nervous system, your internal organs. Everything's affected by good breathing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and it's a form of a pause or a form of stillness or a direct route to stillness. Yes, it cuts the. Again, in Tai Chi, we call it the monkey mind, and, and it, it doesn't take a lot. I uh, I, I find it just um, sharing a couple of movements for five minutes with folks who haven't done this kind of thing before, and, and they'll very quickly say, uh, whoa, you know, I, this, I haven't felt like this for a long time. And a couple of people have said, never, I've never felt like this before. Like Just, just an initial sort of uh, relaxation, because it does cut... Um, the, the big thing there is it brings you to the present moment, right? It brings your cuts your thinking mind or your monkey mind. And I agree with uh, uh, many, again, spiritual teachers like Eckhart Tolle, who I like a lot. And he says, you know, all anxiety takes place in the past and the future. Yeah. It, uh, um, if you're not, if you're in the present, it's not there, and I've kind of tried to observe that, and it's really quite true. It's hard to do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, yes, but. Hey, good point, but it's, it's right there. Um, I've learned that uh, athletes and musicians and performers, uh, like the arts types, yeah. um, they have those transcendent moments in their practice because they have found their medium. So uh, athletes or dancers use their body. Um, musicians have the resonance of good, you know, music. Mm -hmm. And something happens, and off they go into this other world. But they would all say that their breathing shifted, and they were very present. And they were so present, it's like time stopped. Mm -hmm. And then they pop up out of their trance-like state, or their theta state, basically. And, and they're like, whoa, three hours went by. Or they'll say things like, I have no idea where that song came from. Yeah, I, I was in another state. The athlete will talk about, well, everything moved in slow motion. Yeah. And all of that has the same common root, which was being in the present. Yeah, I think the creative, you're right, the creative process brings brings us to that that point, however we, like you say, however you, whatever pathway. You, and that's a good a good way to connect with the book because I do talk about pathways that, that uh, really the, it's a personal kind of spirituality or pathway to, to stillness, and many of us may not be aware that we uh, perhaps we already do something that gives us a taste of that, and then we may want to expand on that or or find another pathway that's more direct or 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 is designed for that or however you want to put it. But yeah. but at that it's much more wide open. I know speaking to students at university where I teach courses on aging and spirituality, aging and Tai Chi, which is actually a credit course that I'm really happy I, I have. Good. And um, 
And a lot of these students will, when I talk about spirituality, they say, well, I took this course, you know, sort of curious, but or it fit my time schedule, you know, and I say, that's, all, that's fair enough, you know. But uh, as they go along, they say, you know, the thing about spirituality is it's been shoved down my throat often all my life, and I, I, I'm not doing that. You know, I had my own. And so they really respond to this, where I say, well, why don't you just reflect on that a little bit more, or, you know, walk them through some other points of view that are out there. And uh, and they really respond to that. So they are interested in, because for me, spirituality, spirituality is really closely tied to meaning, what's meaningful in our lives. Psychologists don't do a very good job with that concept. I don't know why, but but uh, spirituality means, so when I put it together like that and they say, well, what's meaningful to me? My family, my my uh, creative process, my friends, whatever it happens to be. And they yeah, and then they say, yeah, that is kind of, you know, it gives me some peace in my life and, and helps me find more meaning in my story and so on. So so I, the part of why I wrote that book is just open, get away from some of the stereotypes and open things up a little bit more. To continue the conversation on exploring spirituality, which isn't religion, it's something, and religion could be part of it, but it's somehow bigger, or it's the soul, because everybody gets there their own way. Um the self-help industry has gone boom. I mean, we even call it an industry now, which isn't has elements of the uh, not authentic to it because each person has to get there on their own. And then with that comes, you know, aging populations. One of New Brunswick's big narratives is, you know, we're the oldest population in Canada. And uh, mm -hmm. part of me wants to take the statistics and just squeeze them mm -hmm. because you can do anything with statistics and come up with a narrative and whether it truly reflects your province um, and the... And the entire well-being of that province, I don't know. But in there sits you <laughs> with teaching older people a way of working with energy in their history to maybe be a, a bit happier or to find purpose into their third act. Yeah. D does that fit? Yeah. Is that your experience? Yeah, I think um, first, as you say, I think uh, being the oldest population in Canada, uh, as we're starting to see some more movement towards balanced or positive or or what older adults, whatever they are, the age cut off, but yeah. uh, actually contribute to everything rather than draining things. That's the <laughs> apocalyptic demography that we, we <laughs> gerontologists try to dispel every chance we get, but... That's a t-shirt, apocalyptic, what was it? Apoc apocalyptic demography, <laughs> that old people are draining and going to gonna put yeah. the province down the tubes or the whole country down yeah. the tubes or whatever. The media said that about young people once upon a time too. So. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, there's so many misconceptions which are slowly, and there's a, there are some very, very uh, committed people in the province right now, uh, uh, gerontologists or people who work in, in the community, very active in trying to... Uh, and including you, actually, uh, to try to dispel these stereotypes to provide a more balanced view of uh, of aging. Hmm. Um, and what what I do uh, first first I, I've been interested in life stories, as you know, for a long time, and um, and as looking at aging from a narrative or a life story point of view and then what I've added to more recently with this this book and what I'm interested in now is to add the stillness to the story hmm. because I think story our life story is not just about emotions and facts and thoughts and it, it's also about this part of ourselves our inner life our, our inner peace or stillness that we all have there somewhere whether you have Alzheimer's disease doesn't matter you you, you have this stillness in you so I'm trying to put that into the picture of uh, how we understand aging and the life story. But the other concept I find really helpful or approach is is to look at aging as changes. Um, so uh, several years ago, I started to teach younger students. Most of my students are chronologically younger. So aging to them is, oh, my grandparents. <laughs> or, and that might be a positive thing, or, or but they still look at it uh, as um, you know, these older people, whoever they are. It's time-based. Yes, exactly. And uh, so I started saying, well, aging is really, it's about changes, and it doesn't matter what age you are. So uh, did you leave home recently? 
you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your partner. Uh, um, what about money? What, you know, what about your health? And 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 they, and I said, well, guess what? If you're 15 or 105, you could be experiencing some of these things. You know, and uh, and gradually that uh, both I find with the younger adults and more so more increasingly with, with all of us that looking at it that way puts a different frame on it like you know now i'm i'm going to be you know i'm going to be 70 what, what what does that mean i mean uh, and and of course as a gerontologist i'm observing i look at these things all the time i'm observing people around me and there's just more and more of us who are 80 85 90 95 driving a car going on trips doing living independently with a little help perhaps but there's more and more of, of that happening as the time for the time part of it yep. but for the other part of it it's just changes so how do i encounter and help to have have a more meaningful or more stillness in my life with the changes that are occurring yep. to me and then I can learn about some of those from somebody who's been around, like one of my 93-year-old friend, George Wakeling, who died a few years ago. He, you know, he was helping me out with the stressful situation I had. And I said, oh, thanks, George, you're pretty wise. And he said, well, I've been around the block so many times, I, I hope I picked up a few things. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and that becomes important. Uh, side note, in my head it wants to connect, but maybe it'll be um, um, too much of a gap of question. Is part of our challenge, our North American culture, that's been commodity-driven, consumer-driven, and we've done that to aging? And I'm wondering if First Nations culture or if some other cultures have a whole different context for how they talk about aging. Maybe they don't even call it aging. Um, I don't know whether they call it aging, but... Um but they do have a different perspective on that because it's tied to nature. Probably more like a Taoist, which Tai Chi comes from, a Taoist philosophy. I think there's probably, although I haven't looked in detail, there were probably a lot of spiritual uh, connections there. Yeah. Um, but also the um, the term, uh, you know, language is, is important and we talk about seniors and old people and so, you know, we, we are always trying to get away from calling people, uh, for example, the term elderly, it's an awful term because it's been picked up and the connotation is elderly are all sick and about, about to die and draining the system. That word itself is really not appropriate, but I think the word elder is the best word we could use. And you find that in many cultures where elder means you're older, but you're also respected and you, and you have a purpose in, in being around. Yep. And I think that's, even with the language, we need to, that would be a really good thing to move away from. Even senior, many people don't mind being called a senior, but I think the term elder really captures a lot of the uh, yeah. positive meaning about the life course. Yeah, it captures the soul of it, and it fits in with your notion of changes. Yeah, so that there is, yes. Uh, there's even one, uh, again, I, I haven't studied this in detail, but one of my students did a presentation on, uh, native tradition, uh, aging, and uh, native tradition and spirituality, and they, they even had a uh, a role for elders uh, that went into talking about ancestors. And there's another really in many spiritual traditions we we honor our ancestors, and you know from a now we're learning from modern physics that our DNA goes back to the <laughs> Big Bang or whatever. Yep. It's all we're all stardust, and so people like. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist uh, teacher, he'll say, you know, when you're when you're praying, when you're meditating, when you're praying, um, you're 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 connecting not just with this lifetime. You're connecting with all that stuff that goes back, and that's a really nice way to think about things. You know? Yeah, and that's the theme of it's all connected. Yes, if you yeah. can accept that premise, and your pathway there is through breathing and being still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like so to take that construct and to go back to the aging narrative, or its dysfunction as an aging narrative, and what we need to change. Um, and little New Brunswick. So, well, so one of the themes that always comes up in the show is that New Brunswick's so small, and we all know each other. We can affect change quicker. So I want to put those two things together: changing the narrative on aging, 
to be more about elders, as well as a province that's so small and we're so close to each other that we can do things a bit quicker than places with bigger populations or maybe more entrenched perspectives. That would then change the political landscape, which would then change how decisions are made about senior care facilities or budgets, etc. It's a stretch, but I'm wondering if you see from your professional studies, your personal journey, that there's a window here in the next five or ten years to change the narrative in New Brunswick? Uh, I think there's some good signs of that <clears throat> happening just, you know, over the last, what, year or so. We've had the Day for the Ages and uh, a summit with, and those, um, with, with, you, you know, you facilitated a couple of those that I've been at, and those events are really attracting large, relatively large audiences of uh, New Brunswickers who are catching on to this because those events are, are, are meant to bring people together to change this narrative and to, and to uh, turn that into some, some practical, hmm. um, practical activities. So I think there's definitely the potential for that. And I think um, you see some spin-offs of that after these gatherings where people decide they're going to go and start up on their own something. Then we have some really good leadership in, uh, say, long-term care, which is, uh, you know, we tend to, look, again, we look at aging and, and we think everybody's in a nursing home and they're, and they're, they're in a chair in a corner and, you know, mm-hmm. we, and, um, but now we're, we're changing that through some pretty good, pretty good stuff, I think, uh, Nursing homes like uh, I'll make a plug for a couple of them yeah. now, like uh, Loch Lomond Villa and in, mm-hmm. in St. John York Care Center here in Fredericton. I have to, I'm very proud because one of one of our graduates, uh, Daphne Noonan, is uh, executive director of Nashwalk Villa, which is a nursing home outside Fredericton. And these folks and some others that I may have left out, um, they are changing the culture of long-term care through um, well person-centered care or narrative care yeah. um, and so from what the what the uh, objective is is from top to bottom in in those institutions from the management to the person who's the custodian top to bottom I don't look at people from top yeah, to yeah. bottom but you know what I mean yeah um, that they're they're uh, the, the the narrative care or respect for the person respect for their story is part of everything that goes on there and and that changes things right away. When the family comes in, they see something different. They and and they're dealing with a whole lot of their own stereotypes, often about their older parents and uh, needing to take care of them. And there's nothing they can do. And you know the, the whole that whole negative scenario. So I think uh, there's a number of movements happening now. Now, um, you know how that how quickly or how that impacts the actual money process and decision making yeah. process is is a uh, an ongoing but i think there's some good signs of, of both the momentum mm-hmm. of uh people wanting to do that and i think you're right and because we are a smaller population it isn't hard to to be talking in person with the people that are most involved with these things yeah we have access to each other yeah <clears throat> can we help make new brunswick a happy place because there's an emotion attached to what you just described. And we talked about it in terms of policy or social shifts, but it's still emotional at its root. Um, well, I think any any of these initiatives that we're talking about, when it when it gets when it changes the culture of a nursing home or changes the culture of a community, then yeah, we're going to be happy. Is one word you can use that we're you know we're going to. F- feel better these movements don't they don't just affect like say it's a resident of a nursing home it doesn't it doesn't just affect them it affects their families it affects everybody who works there it affects when they go home to their families and their lives and and then they're perhaps dealing with a situation in their own home they well well now I'm aware of this you know this is I can do this differently and there's and I have an option there's a lot of a lot of folks don't realize that there are other options out there. There are a lot of older caregivers, for example, who are so used to being fiercely independent and I'm taking care of my husband or my wife and nobody's going to tell me what to do. And um, and so they don't 
we're not open to even looking for resources for a different way of of uh, talking about things and and being with the situation, like taking care of themselves, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit in the book about that too, about caregiving, uh, bringing stillness to caregiving, mm -hmm. so that you're caring for someone else, but you're caring for yourself as well. And there's a new language uh, I've read a little bit about called uh, care partnering. And it's one idea that w what it does is it, it, it gives, it empowers both persons, even if one is frail and one's helping the other one who's frail. It helps to think, well, what can that other person contribute to this situation? Whatever it happens to be, it could be something very small or mm -hmm. that, that would give me respite because I can leave for a few hours because I can help them to be alone this way or whatever it happens to be. But the, whole, the language itself, instead of one person having a burden of caring for someone else, it becomes more of a partnership, which I, in my, um, uh, I teach Tai Chi in a couple of nursing homes uh, here in Fredericton. And one is with a, a group of dementia survivors. And even with those folks, there are ways to be with them that make them feel respected, make them feel that they're they're able to be there with this process, even if they can't move physic physically very much. So that all changes things to a happier situation, if you want to use the term happiness. Yeah. Yeah, I was pushing it towards that happiness index, you know. Um, a lot of times the social challenges, the shared systemic challenges we face, um, we keep approaching them in the same way, thinking we're going to get a different result. Um, there's 40 or 50 years of that now. It may be we need to change the paradigm or how we're asking the question in order to get the breakthrough we're looking for. So that's what I wanted to play with a little bit about maybe if we reframed it a different way, talk about happiness instead, these issues around literacy, aging populations, will will find a different solution. It is a good point. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues who's in one of our edited volumes uh, talks about asking the right questions. <laughs> yeah, and just reframe it. We have about five minutes left. Um, this has been a real treat. Uh, I'm trying to guess what the audience might be thinking about Gary Keenan and, and the journey you've had. Um, I'm trying to picture you teaching <laughs> people uh, about how to do this, um, c can you can you describe it in, in more concrete terms? What it's like working with a uh, dementia patient, or c do you have a story from your personal experience with teaching Tai Chi, and and it's a a aha moment for them and, and for you? Um, well, I have many stories, and I actually have a, a chapter in the book that recounts short short stories, and some of them are quite humorous and uh, in a respectful way, uh, really, really fun. Um, but one of the one of the most powerful ones, uh, experiences I've had um, was that one of, in one of the classes that I do, there is um, a chronologically younger uh, staff person who shadows another staff person and she has autism syndrome, quite, quite um, intense autism syndrome. So when I first met her, this was probably four years ago or so now, she started to come to the Tai Chi class once a week and sit, sat down and didn't look at me, you know, was very, very shy, didn't look at me at all, didn't say anything, uh, and just sat there for a few weeks. And after that, she started uh, humming to the music, because I play soft music in this class, started humming to the music. So and then another day I went up and I said, um, I won't use her real name, but I said, uh, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? So and so. And she said, she looked right at me. And she said, hi. So right there, that was a uh, huge, <laughs> that was just huge for me. And then, uh, and then as uh, time went on, she started doing a lot of the movements. And every time I'd go there, I'd say hi. And she'd say hi back. And then at um, Christmas time, uh, I always go for a hug. I ask them for a hug, and they can. I tell them, you know, push me away. You know, it's all up to you. You know, so. And I went up to her and I said, you know, could I have a hug? She just reached out and gave me this wonderful hug. I was in tears, you know, because the, these folks can be. It's very hard for them to trust trust anything that's going on. To, just to end that story, we now have a tradition where, at the end of every class. We do a movement called wave your hands like a cloud. And when I get to that point, 
I look over at her and I say, and she says, wave hands like clouds. And it's just like this, uh, the, the, her, it's, it's such a special thing for her to do and for, for me to receive. So there's, yeah. there are other stories like, like this that I've, I've been blessed to, to be part of. And, and uh, that's why I love doing this. You know? yeah. yeah. Thank you for this. That's a great place to end. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah. it's a great conversation. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.